Good evening, Sandy Ridge. Sound a little bit like Adrian Cronauer there, didn't I? Some people knew who I actually know who Adrian Cronauer is. That's kind of funny. So, if you don't know who Adrian Cronauer is, he's the Good Morning Vietnam. Yeah, yeah, I played by Robin Williams. Actually, uh, Adrian Cronauer spoke at my. The real Adrian Cronauer spoke at my college graduation. It was pretty cold, yeah. So um, I'm glad you're back in the house of the Lord tonight. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, welcome and uh, make yourself at home as we sing, we pray, and we, uh, we study the Word of God. I will open us up tonight in the uh, book of Psalms 121. It's entitled, God the Help of Those Who Seek Him. I will lift up my eyes to the hills from whence comes my help. My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. That's the reading of the word of the Lord. All right, everybody, please stand with me and grab your hymn books. We're going to start with number two, um, number two, and we'll do verses one, three, and four. <clears throat> and then I'm going to let you be seated. Uh, I don't have any announcements, but Miss Virginia is going to come up and share a little bit regarding our uh, Afghanistan family we met today. So let's pray. Father, thank you for the day you've given us and your blessings. We thank you for bringing us together here this afternoon again to worship you and hear God's word spoken. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for loving us. and Thank you for all you do in meeting our needs. Thank you for the freedoms we have in the great country we live in. Lord, we thank you for your many blessings, and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. I was just about to say good morning also. <laughs> 
<laughs> I'm right there with you. Um, well, I wanted to, um, first of all, just rejoice with you guys, share some answers to prayer in uh, this new season of our ministry with our Afghan family. Uh, this past Wednesday it was the 90-day mark, which means that on Tuesday, with Samaritan's Purse, I'll do a, a case closure interview. And practically speaking, what that means is I'll have less paperwork. So praise God for that. <laughs> We're still spending a lot of time uh, interacting with um, with our family. Uh, many of you got to see them at the Memorial Day uh, cookout a couple weeks ago. They also came out several times during VBS, and they've told us multiple times just how well loved they have felt by the church family, how thankful they are that we opened our home to them, and uh, just, you know, they, they just kept saying, oh, the, the people at the church, they're, they're really good people. Uh, the, the time that stands out to me the most, though, is when one of uh, Ahmad Zai's relatives came out at the beginning of May when they were actually going through a really, really difficult season, really wondering if uh, life so isolated from their, um, from any Afghan community was going to be sustainable long term. And so they had a good friend and relative come out and visit, and it just happened to be on an evening that our team families were throwing a birthday party for a couple of their their children they have kids with birthdays april 28th and 29th and at the end of that visit although he had come out to try and persuade them to come and live where all the rest of the afghans live by the end of it he he said i i told them you guys are not like other americans um i i see how much you love them and um I told them I think that they are really in a really good place with you all. And so we, we praise God for that. This guy has lived in the States for five years. He speaks good English. He's had good opportunities. And um, he has seen what uh, everybody who comes to our church sees, which is what a loving and caring church is and what a beautiful picture of the gospel that is. Um, we've had opportunities to share scripture with them in uh, Dari, I mentioned a couple weeks ago, the wife, Marjan, has a Turkish-speaking brother. And so uh, just through video calls with him, I've had opportunities to share scripture and share the gospel in Turkish with, um, with an Afghan family uh, that's still on the ground. You know, the kind of access that we <laughs> long for and labored for all those years that uh, we were sent out as as workers through the through the IMB and so the gospel is going forth uh, we're having the opportunity to share the love of Christ they feel loved they're relatively settled although that's a, a need a prayer need um, for sure and then the Lord is giving us all kinds of open doors to share the gospel um, and so we continue to pray that God will, will open their eyes. Um, our biggest need remains housing for them. Uh, the housing market is very difficult, and I remind myself often that God is sovereign <laughs> over the housing market. And so we're continuing to pray, and we want to invite you all to see if you might be a part of God's plan to provide housing for them. If you know somebody who might know somebody who might have uh, an affordable, suitable place for a family. Um, we, we would love for you to seek out those opportunities, seek us out. And uh, we, we wanted to let you know too that we were just made aware this week of the fact that uh, Ahmad Zai's family feels so loved and welcome and happy here uh, that some more of his family is asking about the possibility of coming as well. It wouldn't be in the same capacity, it wouldn't be the same level of responsibility, uh, but, that, but that's, that's how well that loved they feel, that's how happy they are, and that's another opportunity to share the gospel with a family that we would not have had access to because we can't just hop on a plane to Kabul right now. And um, so we would love for you to pray with us and for us 
with that, uh, we want to invite you guys to prayerfully consider uh, a couple of specific needs that we have uh, to grow our team. If you might have a couple of hours a week or even some a couple hours a month to help us, uh, one is, uh, the, the, the big one is looking for housing, just pursuing housing leads. And then another would be uh, someone to come alongside Ashley Moretz to help with some of the, the medical case management. And um, I don't have the third one written down. Andy? Yes, uh, some, someone that would coach them through, um, be really focused on helping them learn English. They've come a long way. They have a long way to go. English is not an easy language to learn. And so um, thank you for your time, your attention. Thank you so much for your partnership in the gospel with this. This, this would not be possible if, you know, just just Virginia had a random idea of wanting to go make some friends. This is, this is our church coming together to um, That's right. uh, to yeah. welcome yeah. Uh, those who have fled for refuge. And um, I, I praise God for, for you all and for your partnership in this. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. I wonder if I could get someone to pray for Ahmad Zai and Marjan, their soul, their salvation. Is there anyone willing to stand and do that, that God would work in what we've done here? And... Uh, Let's see here. There must be someone that's willing to pray for this family. Danny, would you please stand and do that? Oh, Lord, we just thank you for this wonderful opportunity to serve and love on this family. We thank you that you have brought them to us. And we thank you for the love that they have received from this congregation. And we know that those conversations about you that they have. And Father, we pray that Amen. Thank you. So I want to read a little uh, excerpt. Frankie and Madigan are on their way to California now to represent you and I at the Southern Baptist Convention. I think it's been 10 years since we've sent anyone to the Southern Baptist Convention. If you're not sure what that means, it's an annual meeting made up of 47,000 churches like ours called Southern Baptist Churches. And they meet once a year. That meeting is called a convention. But when people belong to or give to the, the funding for missions, they become what you might call a convention church, a Southern Baptist Convention Church. So that's where they are. Uh, but the reason I bring that up is not only so you'll pray for them, but also uh, Frankie is in the middle of quite a project right now to be ready for the next time he speaks to you, which might be on a Sunday night or a Wednesday night. He's uh, wanting to boost our faith as a church in, um, in trusting the, the Word of God as it was first inspired then preserved in its original language, then translated into what we have. So I've got him, and then fit that onto one page. Um, single spaced, <laughs> no smaller than three quarter inch margins. Um, and it's like, hey, kick it back. And so I'm in a tent in Texas saying, not good enough. And um, it's, it's easy when you're sitting in a chair looking at your phone and telling them, nope, nope, nope. So. I want to read from a book that's helpful. It's called The Inspiration and Authority of the Bible. This man has long since passed, Benjamin Warfield. Listen to what he says. Uh, in Eden, the Lord God had been present with sinless man in such a sense as to form a distinct element in his social environment, Genesis 3. This intimate association was broken up by the fall, but God did not therefore withdraw himself from concernment with men. Rather, he began at once a series of interventions in human history by means of which man might be rescued from his sin and despite it brought to the end destined for him. These interventions involved the segregation of a people for himself, 
by whom God would be known, and whose distinction should be that God would be nigh to them as he was not nigh to other nations. But this people, the Hebrews, was not permitted to imagine that it owed its segregation to anything in itself fitted to attract or determine the divine providence. No, consciousness was more poignant in Israel than Jehovah had chosen it, not it him. Let me say that again. Consciousness was more poignant in Israel than that Jehovah had chosen it and not it him. And that Jehovah's choice of it rested solely on his gracious will. Nor was this people permitted to imagine that it was for its own sake alone that it had been singled out to be the sole recipient of the knowledge of Jehovah. It was made clear from the beginning that God's mysterious, gracious dealing with it, the nation of Israel, had as its own ultimate end the blessing of the whole world, and that is why he made himself known to them. That's page 71. The first 70 pages are introduction, and uh, I feel like I don't have to read introductions. So... I have, uh, for not book collectors, I'm not interested in giving this away to a book collector, but to someone who might read it, I have four copies to give away tonight, and I'm, oh, you already got me coming down this aisle, so here we are, and uh, you can usually trust Warfield, Uh, he can't change anything he says because he's dead, and here you are, pass that behind you, and uh, what's uh, what's our next number we're going to sing? Please find number 39. Number 39 was written in the mid-1800s by a man who worked for the, uh, you can, yeah, you can stand. We'll let you stand one more time, please. It was written by a man who wrote 11 verses for this song. And how many of you uh, think it's uh, manna from heaven that we only have four written down there, or three or four? And we're going to sing, are we going to sing them all? Okay, we're going to sing them all. And this was, uh, again, 11 verses were written. I'm sorry we couldn't include them all here. I'm looking forward to singing them with you. Amen. You may be seated. How many of you have heard that one before? Can I see your hand? About 11 of you. A few more. Okay. How about that? Well, that is, uh, that's, I was noticing in my hymnal here that I've been tagging around for about eight months. That's the first time I think we've sung that. So would you please turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Timothy? 1 Timothy, if you need the Pew Bible, is found on page 1455. I want to review one verse that we looked at this morning and then call Brother Ronnie up to read this evening's passage. Again, we're in 1 Timothy chapter number 2. If you need the Pew Bible, page 455. 
If you need a Bible, please take this one with you. Bring it back and forth with you to church. Mark in it. Make it your own. And we'll replace it. Because we don't have scads of building debt or other kinds of debt, we can afford, like we chose to do in December as a church, to put aside $20,000 to help the Afghanistan family. And we can just basically, we need Bibles. Let's spend $2,000 on Bibles. That's the kind of thing you can do if you don't all owe all kinds of money. And we don't have to beg for money, plead for money. You know, we understand through membership that we support this church through our tithing. And many of you who are not members but are faithful, you understand God's work is, uh, it does cost money. And you, we all give. We all give. And so I'm thankful for that. So this Bible has been provided by your church. 1 Timothy chapter number 2, and we're looking at verse number, four, or verse number 7. For which I was appointed a preacher and an apostle. I am speaking the truth in Christ and not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. Let's just do simple math. If preaching and teaching were the same, he would not have said both. Right? So what we're going to do tonight is a little case study out of the Word of God uh, in Acts chapter 17. Brother, would you come up? Acts chapter 17, and we're going to do a case study on what it means to preach and then teach the gospel. Acts chapter 17 is found on page six, uh, 1361, and that's page 1361, or Acts chapter 17. What verse did we start? Or did we say we we're going to start? Verse number 15, please hear the word of the Lord, Acts chapter 17, verse number 15. So those who conducted Paul brought him to Athens, and receiving a command for Silas and Timothy to come to him with all speed, they departed. Now while Paul waited for them at Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Therefore he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with the Gentile worshippers and in the marketplace daily with those who happened to be there. Then certain Epicurean and Stoic philosophers encountered him, and some said, What does this babbler want to say? Others said, He seems to be a proclaimer of foreign gods, because he preached to them Jesus and the resurrection. And they took him and brought him to the Epagus, saying, May we know what this new doctrine is of which you speak? For you are bringing strange things to our ears. Therefore, we want to know what these things mean. For all the Athenians and the foreigners who were there spent their time in nothing else but either to tell or to hear something new. Then Paul stood in the midst of the Apagos and said, Men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are religious. For I was passing through and considering the objects of your worship. I even found an altar with this inscription, To the unknown God. Therefore the one whom you worship without knowing, him I proclaim to you. God who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands. Nor is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and to the boundaries of their dwellings. So they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we have life and move and have our being. As also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, something shaped by art and man's devising. Truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance to this by all, rising him from the dead. And when they had heard of the resurrection of the dead, some mocked, while others said, he, We will hear about this again on this matter. So Paul departed from among them. However, though some men joined him and believed, Damas the Aragonite, a woman named Duras, and others with him. That's the word of the Lord. 
Thanks be to God indeed. It's good to have God's word, isn't it? All right, one more time, would you pray with me? Father, I pray that you would minister to us truth, that we might uh, be glad and rejoice all of our days. Thank you for the simple truths that we will find in this passage. Thank you for showing them first to me. And now, Lord, I pray for your divine enablement to make it clear to these, your people. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty, so what you have here is a passage of Scripture, as you know my style. We won't be back to it. Acts 17, this is our one look at it, far as I'm concerned, until I croak. And I'm, my prayer is that you will see that uh, in God's good kindness, he gave us an example of what it means not only to declare the truth, but to teach the truth. Here you can see that Paul is preaching truth. Preaching means to herald a truth. That's what the word means. It means to herald truth. H-E-R-A-L-D, to declare something. Teaching it kind of is more than just saying, this is a car, okay? How do you know it's a car? It's a car because it has certain things that cars have. Teaching it means, come over here, let me lift the hood, let me show you why we would call it a car, how it functions as a car, how you can better understand the car so that you can explain the car to someone else. They're both needed. You have to be able to declare something as true, but there are some people that want to know why it's true. Some people are convicted immediately when they're told something that's true. God uses the truth. They are emotionally, and, and by the way, this is not a, a weakness. Some people are strongly inclined emotionally when they hear something, yeah, yeah, that's, that sounds right. That should be how that is. And other people want to lift the hood. Other people need the teaching of the gospel. We, we need both preaching and teaching. Some of us, one more than the other, but all of us, both. So that is why I'm always cautioning our Sunday school teachers, make sure you don't get too preachy, or they're going to get a double header. And I also say, make sure you teach them lots of good stuff, because they, um, they're, they're going to hear teaching and the preaching as well at 1030, 6 o'clock, Wednesday night, all that. Um, I think one of the better... Um, insults I've received since being in Sandy Ridge is you're more of a teacher than a preacher. I don't know whether to say thanks or thanks a lot, but I think that that is a mighty fine compliment. Uh, because if I can not only tell you that is a car, but lift the hood and show you why it's a car, well then I'm grateful for as long as it lasts. And so in Acts chapter 17, you have Paul who's on a missionary journey, missions trip. It's a long one. He doesn't, you know, go two weeks to hand out flyers and build pulpits. Nikki and I were involved with one of those. I'll never do it again. Um, and, uh, you know, like the lasting fruit of those things is, is uh, scarce. But when we go somewhere, do gospel work, um, that's good. But this is a no kidding missions trip. The man is taking months and in some cases years at single places. And he is planting churches. He's not planting concerts. He's not planting quartets. He's planting churches. People that settle it with themselves, among themselves, that they're going to gather every Lord's Day at least and teach and preach truth. So here you might notice he is waiting in verse 16 while Paul waited for them at Athens. For who? Verse 15, Silas and Timothy. Silas and Timothy are a little bit behind him. They're back there at Berea, which is earlier in the chapter, and they're uh, arranging for some, uh, they're doing some work on Paul's behalf. Paul is what we might call inconvenienced. He is now at a bus station with plenty to do, rather nothing to do, and plenty of time to do it. And a lesson here is that what we read, or what we have heard read, is that many of the most important things in life are very quick, they're short, but they're what you want to do your entire life. Paul is doing something very mundane and normal and unexciting. He's waiting for two fellow travelers to hurry up and catch up. I think you and I can identify with this. We do normal stuff a lot, and we get irritated quickly with people who go from event to event living for the next thing. They haven't grown up. They've, they were the kid in the back seat saying, are we there yet, are we there yet? Now they're 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 years old saying, can't wait till the grandkids get here. Can't wait till the great grandkids get here. Can't wait for Thanksgiving. Can't wait for Christmas. Can't wait for the beach trip. Can't wait for the mountain trip. Everything is about events for them. 
And simple, go to work, love your family, pay your bills, go to church is just not exciting for them. Make sure the weeds are pulled out of your flower garden. Stuff that has to be done, but is not exciting. And here, Paul is waiting. Uh, It's fresh on my mind, so let me just reflect here a little bit. I've always been told, don't tell personal stories. I believed that when I got here. I don't believe it anymore. I think you need to know just about how human I am. When I became an army chaplain, I had in my mind all the pictures I saw. Maybe you can see them with me. That old painting of Stonewall Jackson in his tent and the chaplain standing by in the black suit waiting to pray with the, with the general. I was like, man, I would love to do that. I would love to be the chaplain. Juan, you know, precious little time is spent doing that for the chaplain. In other words, you think you're going to say, chapel service over here under the tent by the flag, and the entire battalion shows up anxious to hear the word of the Lord. And you realize, no, they're not. They're not. And in fact, you spend 95% of your time doing normal stuff. Staff work for the commander, advisement to tell him what in the world he's going to do to this population if he travels on that road on that day because that's a religious holiday and America's the only godless nation on the planet. We say one nation under God, but the truth is we're part of the 17% of the world that's secular. The other 83% of the world lives according to religion. So when you tell a really godless brigade commander, sir, if you go into that village on that day, the sheikh is going to hate your guts and you're not going to get anything out of the village. Oh, I didn't know that chaplain. Yep, that's why you have me, sir. You know, and so you do normal stuff, 19 out of 20 minutes, sleep, every now and then wash your feet, that kind of thing, right? Eat, normal stuff, make sure your sleeping bag's okay, your tent's not ripped, make sure your chaplain assistant is not acting like a stooge, all kinds of stuff. That's normal, common, unexciting stuff. And why do I do it? Because of of moments like Thursday morning, when for just a few minutes after breakfast, I'm in a chow tent talking to 10 soldiers about the gospel, a service that's sponsored by the U.S. government. What did I do most of the week? Waited, looked not busy. If you look busy as a chaplain, and I'm finding out if you look busy as a pastor, everyone thinks you're too busy. And then they don't think they can talk to you because you're too busy. I realize that pastors and chaplains are supposed to actually look like they're not that busy so that you'll talk to them. In fact, you pay me so that I don't have to do a lot of other stuff. Here's Paul doing almost nothing. If he was busy doing everything, he would not have had, verse 16, his spirit provoked within him when he sees, when he looks around. Now, if he was busy trying to guide a tour because the church over in America that's desperate to feel important about missions sends 25 kids over for their summer break, he would feel like he had to find him a bus and then a tour day in a coliseum somewhere. But because he's in Mars Hill, Athens, and he is spent, he realizes that he's just got him and he's going to wait. Looks around, he sees some false gods and some false idols, and what does he say? He, it says he stirred within him. Look at verse 19. They took him. Why did they take him? Verse 18, Epicureans and Stoic philosophers encountered him. Some said, what does this babbler want to say? When did he start saying? Verse 17, he reasoned in the synagogues with the Jews and with the Gentile worshipers in the marketplace daily. So he goes to the synagogue, then to the marketplace, and then certain people in the marketplace said, this guy is a babbler. So what do they do? Verse 19, they took him and brought him to Arapagus. And where's Arapagus? Well, it's a place where people get together and debate. That was big in the Grecian world. Get together and debate. Uh, you know, it's like uh, Twitter, except you get more than 144 characters. You get to speak a good long while, sip your, sip your latte, and have your time to speak. It's Paul's turn, verse 22. He stands in the midst of this built-in Arapagus and says, Men of Athens, I perceive in all things you're very religious. Very religious. So the end of the story is that you have three groups of people. Look at verse 32, 33, 34. It says, when they heard the resurrection of the dead, some mocked. Others said, we'll hear you again on this matter. So you have some people that mocked and said, be gone. Others said, I might be able to take part two. Verse 33, so Paul departed from among them, and some joined him and believed. Here's a good trisection, if you will, 
of the responses that we'll get when we preach the death and resurrection of Jesus. Some will mock. It's not for them. Some will say, I probably need to hear some more about this, but some other time. And others will follow you because they're believers, verse 34. How much control did Paul have over that anyway? Can you think of a better Christian than Paul? And two-thirds of the audience is described as not believing. So I want you to see a few things here. We're going to go through it together, and I just want you to notice a few things. We are not going to cover all ten. We don't have time. We'll get through what we can. Feel free to ask questions. When you come through this passage, you realize that he, first of all, does not start on Mars Hill quoting the Old Testament. Why? They didn't know the Old Testament. What did they know? Greek mythology. And so what does he do? He quotes them one of their own poets in verse 28. As some of your own poets have said. How does he know any of what the poets of Greece say? Is Paul Grecian? We know he's Roman by birth, but what's he spent most of his time studying? Yeah, he's a Pharisee. He sat at the, at the feet of a well-versed Pharisee teacher. He spent most, most of his time understanding the laws and laws about the laws, and laws to keep you from breaking the laws about the laws. Yes, many layers of law. But what he does make clear here is a few things. Let's see if we can, let's see if we can go at it. Notice, number one, I call them Martians because they're at Mars Hill. I don't think they're from Mars, really. Martians worshiped God in a sense. The reality is I needed to shorten the line so it would fit it on one line. So, and not go below 32 font. You're welcome. So, what did he say to them in verse number 23? I was passing through and considered the objects of your worship. I even found an altar with inscription to the unknown God. Therefore, the one whom you worship without knowing him, I proclaim to you. So Paul is willing to admit that these people, in some sense, are worshiping creator God. We often say, and we should say, that those who do not acknowledge Jesus are not actually worshiping the true God. That's true, in a sense. But when Paul is dealing with people and teaching them the gospel, what got him into this mess anyways where he's talking to them about theology? Well, end of verse 18, he's talking back in the marketplace and he preaches to them at the end of the verse, Jesus and the resurrection. Here's what you should assume from that. They preached the entire life of Jesus. He preached it to them in the marketplace all the way up to his death. And then, three days gap, then his resurrection. You should assume then that what got Paul into this discussion out here on Mars Hill where they debated for fun was that he preached the death and resurrection, the sinless life of Jesus, the sinless death of Jesus, and since we believe that he, what he said this morning, the sinless death of Jesus as a ransom for you and I, and then he was raised from the dead. Talk about a nifty little cheat there on the one to whom the ransom was paid. He raised him from the dead. Here we go then. Now Jesus is dead, raised from the dead, and he tells them, Paul does, you worship the God that I've been preaching to you, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in a sense, it's true. When we look at someone and say, if you don't acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ, you are not worshiping the true God. In some sense, you are justified in looking at a Muslim and saying, I know you think you're worshiping the God who created all things, but if your God doesn't have a son named Jesus... You're not worshiping God. In some sense, you can say that. But notice Paul, and let's sit at his feet a minute. Don't sit at the feet of an angry evangelical. Now, I'm an evangelical, but I'd like to think I'm not an angry one. I'm not angry about anything tonight about what we believe. I think we need to think like Paul is here for a minute. Paul didn't look at him and say, you don't even know his name? You don't name his name as Jehovah? You don't know he has a son? Well, you're not worshiping the true God. Do you see this? I don't want to use the word winsome because it's kind of Sorry, and I don't like it. It's another way of saying I don't want to be courageous. But in its purest sense, this is winsome. He's not out there to hurt people when he preaches the gospel to them. Correct falsehood? Yeah, but look, if they think they're worshiping God, go with them for a minute so you can make a point. How much more effective would it be to look at a Muslim and say, Allah actually has a son if your Allah is the creator God? Some of us are too good for that. We're going to actually argue with Paul's method here. We're going to say, Paul, I know you, the greatest Christian I've ever come in contact with, 
told them they were worshiping the true God. Verse 23, I'm going to make him known to you. You don't know his name, I'm going to tell you what his name is. See that end of verse 23? Wouldn't this have been a great time for Paul to say, you say that's to the unknown God. Well, you could know a God if you wanted to. No, he says, that unknown God, I want to introduce him to you. He has a son who died and rose again. How do I know it's the same crew? Because verse 19, they took him and brought him. Many of the people that heard him in the marketplace talk about Jesus, the death, the resurrection. Those people brought Paul to Mars Hill. Any questions about that? Okay, so here's what I know. I know that Allah is a name of a moon god. I get that. I know that it's made up from almost 2,000 years ago. I know it's a pagan god's name. I'm not pluralistic. Some of you are concerned because we had a lady read from the pulpit this morning, and now I'm talking about telling people that they don't worship God truly, unless, and you're concerned I'm going liberal. Some of you need to talk to the other people in the room that think I'm a stick in the mud. <laughs> the, friends, this morning... This morning, after the morning service, I had someone tell me I wasn't Calvinistic enough, and tonight before the evening service, I had someone tell me that this morning someone told them I was way too Calvinistic. Same sermon. So that is hilarious to me. It is like a year and a half ago, I had someone stay home from church because I said something about the danger of COVID, and I had someone stay home that very next Sunday because in that very same service, I didn't say enough about COVID. I mean, you would think I was wearing gray trousers and a blue coat. <laughs> so I realize that Allah is a pagan name. What I'm trying to get us to see is which is more effective. Telling an Orthodox Jew, you don't really worship Jehovah. You think you do. But you don't think Jehovah has a son, so you're worshiping a false god. I hope you can see that it's probably more effective to say to him, you know, Jehovah did have a son. Creator God of all that is did have a son. Andy? Andy? It changes the dynamic, I believe, but I think on a scale. I know you, maybe you don't. I don't want to read into what you're saying. I would want, if I were sitting in your place asking that question, I would want a yes or no question. But if I'm a Muslim kid in Morocco being taught that the second thing I should recite is Muhammad does not have a son nor ever can, or forgive me, Allah does not have a son nor ever can, well, I, I'm, I'm sitting there thinking to myself, what five-year-old is going to say, well, that's what the Christians believe. I would never believe that. I would like to think that a six or eight or 10-year-old little boy in North Africa being taught that God does not have a son and never will have a son has rejected Christ in a way that is similar but not exactly like the man who says, I know what a Christian is. They believe Jesus, has, Jesus is the very son of God, con con you know, conceived in a virgin, and I reject that. They are infidels. I think there's two different spirits of rejection there, if we could. So if we're talking about that latter case, then yes, I think we could say they've rejected the one true God who they have been told has a son. Sure. But boy, I'll bet you encountered a lot of people in Israel that believe they were worshiping the God of the Bible who said there is no son named Jesus who came from uh, the seed of God or the seed of a woman and God, you know, the Holy Spirit overshadowing her. I'm certain that it was difficult to, to say you're worshiping a false God. Uh, maybe you did it. I don't know. I certainly don't call that into judgment. But what I want to do is make sure that if I meet a Buddhist tomorrow uh, and he says that I am worshiping the invisible universal force, I can say, I could give you his name if you'd like, rather than saying, no, you're not. I, I'd, I'd like to at least give them as much license as here. Now, so I've given you the one sense and the other. So now I'm going to skip ahead because this is good. I think this is related. Look at number four. Number four, Paul tells them in verse 26 that we're all related. He made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. So you might notice verse 27, so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him. 
Now, in verse 26, it looks like God is in control of the progress of man, doesn't it? I mean, look at it if you doubt what I'm saying, please. Never, never leave here saying, no, I just don't feel fed. He's just talking way over my head. It's right there on the pages of your Bible. Verse 26, God has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth. So first of all, let's dispel this lie that, there are more than, that there's more than one race on the earth. There's one race, there's one blood, there are different ethnicities. So racism is an evolutionary term. It supposes that there are different kinds of races, but we've been told there's one blood. The black man and myself have the same blood. So that means then that we are not from different races. Do not allow evolutionary Marxism to inform you or educate you as to what the issue is here. It sounds much more inflammatory to call someone a racist, but there's only one race on the planet. At best, you're discriminatory against another ethnicity, but let's be exact. We said this morning the word Gentile comes from the word ethnos, which means ethnicities. So here we're told in verse 26, by the way, that word every nation there, that word nation, ethnos. He is made from one blood every ethnos of men. All the ethnicities come from one blood. So this teaches the, the historical fact of Adam and Eve. There is, I don't care what 23 and me says, everybody came from one set of parents. And so they have one blood. Now, here's what I'm trying to get at. In a sense, the pagans don't worship our God. In a sense, they do. Here, in verse number 26, he's made from one blood every nation. And notice what it says there. He has determined their pre-appointed times and boundaries of their dwellings. Some countries or some ethnicities conquer others. Why? God says so. Some ethnicities develop faster than others. Why? God says so. Some ethnicities belong in the better parts of the planet than others. Why? God says so. God's sovereignty. That's to please all the Calvinists in the room. Then you notice in verse 27, so that they should seek the Lord in hope that they might grope for him. That's for all you Arminians in the room. I thought God controls everything. Yep, that's 26 for you. I thought God puts all the responsibility in the lap of the chooser. Yep, that's 27 for you. In a sense, it is all God. In a sense, it is all you. Reach after him, verse 27 says. You might find him. How about that? Isn't that nice? Well, let's look at it again and see if we want to dabble with a little bit more of our problems. How about verse 28? Paul, who preached that you're made a child of God through faith, has the audacity to quote a poet to them and then tell them the poet's right. Well, what's the poet right about? Look at the end of verse 28. For we are also his offspring. Now he's quoting the poet. Now look at verse 29. Therefore, since we are the offspring of God, he is no longer quoting the poet. Do you see that? He quotes the poet, says, we're all children of God. And in the next verse, not quoting the poet anymore, he says, since we're all the children of God. Now, what does your evangelical impulse want to do right there? What if you heard Donahue saying that, or Oprah, what would you say? We ain't all children of God, bub, fix that, right? Right? But to as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God, even them that believe on his name. We're only children of God by faith, Genesis, Galatians 3, 7. In a sense, that's absolutely correct. In another sense, since God created all things, we all take our life from him. In a way, he's all of our daddies, and we're his offspring. So please notice that we want to put certain statements of Scripture in the little hoppers and make it all behave super nice so that we can explain God really well. Our best bet is to go to a passage of Scripture and explain it to someone. Here's Paul approaching people, telling them, the God that you think you're worshiping, let's make sure he is the one who made everything. Where does it say that? Verse 26. He controls everything. Where does it say that? Verse 26. He needs nothing. Verse 25. He is omnipresent. Verse 24. You can't contain him in a house. He can be found. He's closer than you think. Verse 27. Man, this is just good stuff, isn't it? And we have found that we have to be willing to, to understand what people mean when they speak. But we are not interested in having conversations. We are done having conversations. We want to say what we believe with a t-shirt, a bumper sticker, or a Twitter post. We are done listening to people. And in fact, Paul here knows how they think and speaks to it. In fact, <laughs> I'm going to just 
finish this with a humdinger and then see if there's a question. In verse 29, since we're his offspring, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone. He says, you're his kids. You're not gold, silver, or stone. <laughs> In a sense, we should never look within to find truth because we're fallen. And here, in another sense, at Mars Hill, Paul says, what are you like? Do you think God is less than you? So he says, we can study God by studying us. Do you think, in verse number 29, do you think that the divine nature is made out of something you're not even made out of and he's your daddy? So there are a great deal of things that we can learn from teaching the gospel. We used to be able to say, if you died today, you know for sure you'd go to heaven. Well, Christ died for your sins. Everyone knew what sin was because they were raised in that culture. Everyone knew who God was. They were raised in that culture. Everyone knew what a son was. We're not even sure what a male is anymore. You have to explain that now. And we, have, we are no longer able to just wham the gospel to someone through a screen door. We have to be willing to not only declare the message preaching, but slow down and teach it. Lift the hood. Questions? When you hear the fan on the projector, it's time to close. <laughs> Father, thank you for the opportunity to preach and teach the word. We know the balance that you've given us. I mean, in two, word, in two verses in Proverbs, rebuke not a scorner. In the next verse, rebuke a scorner. Help us to be willing to see that people are not outputs from factories. All of them unique, special, particular. Help us be willing to see the elasticity of words between languages. Help us to be well-read people who have deep conversations and are willing to stay calm and hear in opposition. Help us to stand on truth, or Paul would have had nothing to preach or teach if everything was not really not really true, just kind of true, a type of true. Help us to learn well from perhaps the greatest Christian that ever lived so that we can, while we're waiting through the mundaneity of life, look around, see opportunities, notice the, the contradictions in society, and address them, in some cases potentially publicly, like this. We thank you, Lord, for your kindness. In Jesus' name, amen. In eight minutes, we will...